and we are live. <clears throat> Good evening. I'd like to uh, welcome you to the Community Development Committee uh, meeting of September 16th, 2020. Uh, I need a call to order. Uh, Jenny, could you make a roll call, please? Mr. Keeler? Here. Mr. Reiner? Here. And Mayor Ambrose Grooms? Here. Thank you. I'd like to uh, welcome my other two committee me uh, members, Chris and Andy, for tonight's meeting and any guests that we have out there. Uh, we have reviewed uh, in great detail all these applications and uh, I think uh, are heartened to see the kind of um, improvements that are being suggested. So I need a, uh, approval of the minutes of the June 15th, 2020 meeting, please. So moved. Is there a second? All second. All in favor, signal by saying aye. Aye. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I guess our friend Chase Ridge is gonna do a staff report, basic staff report. Is Chase out there? Yeah. yeah. Um, just give me a moment to bring the PowerPoint up. Okay, thank you. Um, so good evening. Um, this is a request for review and a recommendation of approval to City Council for the five applications that make up the spring 2020 round of the Beautify Your Neighborhood grant program. Um, I just want to start by saying thank you to all the applicants uh, this year. They have been incredibly patient and understanding given the uncertainties and delays um, surrounding COVID-19. Um, staff has been working with these applicants since January, February of this year. Um, so they've all spent a great amount of time and effort on um, their applications. Um, so I'm hoping and I'm sure that the committee members will, will see um, the hard work and time and effort that these applicants put in as well. Um, as a quick reminder, these are all on one PowerPoint. Um, however, I will be stopping after each um, application just to allow for discussion and for a motion. Uh, for some quick financial background, uh, this year's budget, as with uh, previous years, is $32,000. Um, the request this year totaled $24,000, uh, $24,172, um, rather. Um, you can see those totals broken down just below. They range from $4,180 all the way to the maximum of $5,000. Um, funds remaining this year total almost $8,000. Um, so that is what's left over. Um, so first up is Bow Griffin. Um, the existing conditions are in the bottom left-hand uh, side of your screen. So that's the entry feature on the west side of uh, the entry to the neighborhood here. Um, for some context, this is located at Rings Road and uh, Bow Griffin Lane. Um, the plan for uh, this neighborhood calls for some new um, and replacement plantings, uh, resetting of a stone wall, which is behind that entry feature. Uh, the stone wall has begun to um, lean and kind of uh, slump over. Um, the request is also for um, power washing of the entry features to remove any stains and also for new posts, lamps, and uplighting. Um, the total amount requested for this project is $5,000. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions on this one. Um, otherwise, I know the applicant is also in attendance tonight. Um, and staff is recommending, excuse me, staff is recommending approval of this application. Um, with the um, recommendation that the uh, applicant choose one of three alternatives provided by landscape staff, um, which is outlined in uh, your memo tonight. You know, uh, Chase, your, uh, your analysis is pretty uh, comprehensive, I think, that you sent out. Uh, I would like to uh, hear comments from um, other committee members in uh, particular on any items related to the village of Val Griffin landscape. So if anybody would have a comment, please go ahead, Chris or Andy. 
Uh, Chase, I, I have a question. Um, typically, we uh, it, it, although this this looks like a lovely upgrade, it, I think what we see here in this picture versus what is um, presented in the drawings is going to be a, ter a just a terrific upgrade. I do have a question regarding the power washing. Is normally we do not include in these entire neighborhood grants general maintenance items, uh, but for enhancements and upgrades and things of that nature. So. With the uh, the number, I'm sure far exceeds their match with, with removing the uh, power washing component. But I, I just do want to remind us all that we have not been in the practice of having general maintenance items be a, a part of the beautify your neighborhood grants. So I'm sure that number is is far beneath the threshold. But um, uh, it, it looks like um, you know, it looks like it's going to be lovely. Um, and you know it's it's reached that age where uh, it certainly needs um, some updating. I assume that they. Is there any lighting at this entrance, uh, low voltage type lighting at this entrance at present, or is it just the um, the you know one ten fixtures that are mounted on top? Yeah, to my knowledge, it's just the fixtures that are mounted on top currently. That's correct. Uh, well, the plant selection looks pretty good. It, um, got some, got a crab apple and hydrangeas and boxwoods and juniper and maples and uh, I think it's a it's a nice plant palette. So I I am very supportive and look forward to you know, dressing up this entrance and making it beautiful for all those residents again. Uh, thank you, Chris, for your comments. Andy, anything you want to add to that? I, I am, am fine with the proposal as written. I guess I would ask if Mr. Hutchinson or Ms. Stafford are uh, in agreement or willing to comply with staff's recommendation of the um, changes to those three alternatives. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry, I'm I'm a little bit of hearing challenged and I'm not on the greatest computer. Can you just give me a quick summary of the changes requested? I'm sorry. Chase, would you like to do that? Yeah, definitely. Um, so the recommendation came from landscaping staff. Um, it essentially is for um, a recommendation to choose one of three alternatives to the weeping red Japanese maple. Um, so those alternatives are a Satomi dogwood, great wall lilac, or seven sun flowering tree. Um, so those were the three given by our landscape staff. That should not present a problem at all. Okay. Thank, yeah. thank, thank you, Tom. Um, anything else, Andy? Nope. Uh, I, no, I think it's going to be, a, you know, looking at the uh, entry feature, the sign and the dying text it's used, and I think the Catoni Asters, I agree with Chris, it's going to be a lovely improvement. Uh, is there a motion then for uh, approval of this? So, so moved. Second. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, hey, Tom, thank you for your involvement. This is going to really upgrade the, um, I think, the aesthetic there. I think the plan was comprehensive. I, again, agree, agree with my committee members that the plant selection looks like it's going to be a big improvement. So thank you for taking the time. I know you're spending a lot more than $5,000 to make this a credible improvement for the neighbors. And uh, good luck with the project. And uh, again, thanks for the effort of doing this. Well, We're thank you on. very much. And we can't wait to get started. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank We're going you. To move on now to the Cortona uh, project, please. Yeah. <clears throat> so um, the existing conditions for Cortona, a photo of them, um, is off to the right here. Uh, the plan for Cortona is to remove um, several diseased shrub and shrubs and trees um, in the entry located at uh, Corazon Drive and Tuscany Drive. Um, the plan is to install um, a variety of disease resistant replacements and to give a more four season appeal uh, to the entry. Um, staff is generally um, supportive of this request. However, um, landscape staff did recommend a, um, the applicant choose another more deer resistant variety. 
Um, so I do have a number of options, including Baptista, Bottle Brush, Bottle Brush, Buckeye, Elderberry, Red Twig, Dogwood, or Judd Viburnum. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions you all may have, and I believe the applicant is in attendance for this one as well. Um, committee members, any comments? Uh, I would I would make the same comment or ask the same question, Miss Davis. If you're joining us today, um, are you have you discussed the uh, options that Mr. Ridge presented? Um, I can tell you. It's sage advice. The deer, the deer around me are omnivorous. They will eat everything, and it's extremely frustrating to spend this kind of money on upgrading your community and then have them taken to the ground. Um, so, Miss Davis, have you uh, talked with your other folks there about these uh, other options? Perhaps she's not joining us today. I don't. I, I forgot to unmute. Okay. <laughs> Hi, thanks for having us. Um, yes, we agree with this, and the deer are around that area. So we've actually set a design meeting with um, our Brightview design team in preparation for this discussion tonight, making any of those types of revisions. So we agree with you. That's something that is important. Very good. That's all I have. Chris? My only question is, uh, Chase, the the sub uh, the substitutions you recommended, one of them was the bottle brush buckeye. Um, mm -hmm. Was staff not supportive of the bottle brush buckeye? Or was that a recommended substitution? That's a recommended substitution. Okay, because I see in the um, in the proposal there is actually the bottle brush Buckeye is listed. So I don't know, maybe they've already revised some of these. Um, they have seven of the Aeschylus Parvifloras already on the um, area seven in here. So I, I don't know if uh, they want any, any input. I mean, the bottle brush Buckeyes are really beautiful. They do take some time to establish. They're mm -hmm. you know, three years in, they'll be beautiful. Year one, they, they will look a bit twiggy, but you, you know, if you've got enough patience, it certainly would pay off on that. Um, but other than that, it is, um, you know, they've certainly incorporated some, some color, both in the foliage and in flowering. Um, you know, when, when they talk about plant species, they might want to talk about the winterberry reds. Those are notorious for getting, uh, as John, I'm sure will reiterate, those are pretty notorious for winter burn. And um, a lot of times they, they, well, in an exposed area like this where there's some salt mist and things, they may not perform. But other than that, the plant list looks really good and um, it's certainly going to be a, a really pleasant upgrade. You know, Chris, I got I to, gotta, since you're a horticulturist uh, too, uh, I was just curious, you know, you know, I see alternative to hydrangeas and, you know, some of these hydrangeas and I've, the deer will not don't seem to be eating them, and I, I don't know what your feeling is on that. Like I've seen these pinky winkies and some of these other ones, just with beautiful panicles, the huge panicles on them, and they seem to leave them alone in my yard. I just want to see Chris what your thoughts were on that specific thing. You know, knocking out the hydrangeas. Right. So you know, I have the macrophilia. I think they eat the macrophilias and they don't eat everything else. So. Um, Many of the other hydrangeas, do, you're exactly right. They do quite well. Um, yeah, so and it, for color. Well, and the macrophilias are the one that have that are more vegetative, right? They don't have a woody stem. It's almost like a perennial. You can cut them back to the ground each year, and they refoliate. Yeah. Um, so the ones with woody stems typically do fine with the deer. The ones that don't, I, I have pinky winkies, and I have. Um, I have oak leaf hydrangeas. They, they don't touch the, the pinky winkies or the oak leaf hydrangeas, but I do have some macrophilias and they've eaten those to the ground. So I would stay away from macrophilias. Everything else for me would be on the table. Okay. And that's, you know, that could be a suggestion back to them if they want to uh, go back to some of these other species. Because for, for our area, for sheer summer uh, and fall color, it's just hard to beat hydrangeas. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for their showing this. So, um, 
I've been informed that we have to do a roll call vote on each one of these uh, by the clerk of council. So uh, is there a motion to approve um, Cortona? So moved. Is there a Double second? second? All in favor, um, we'll go down the list. Uh, Chris? Yes. Andy? Yes. John? Yes. Okay, well, thank you very much. And uh, we're looking forward to these improvements. And thank you for making the effort. I mean, throughout Dublin now with this program, which has gone on for numerous years, we've had some great improvements for the community. And you can see it just by driving through the community because there's always a handful of people, Lori, like yourself, who step out and uh, get into the deep water trying to make the neighborhood look nice. And there's, and it's always just a handful and we really appreciate your efforts. So thank you very much. So we thank you very much. We appreciate it. And we've enjoyed working with Chase on this project too. Well, I hope the staff has been helpful. They're a good group really. So um, thank you again. Uh, next is Savona Carton West. <clears throat> Yeah, um, so again with this one, there is an existing conditions photo uh, down in the bottom left hand of your screen. Um, the plan for Savona is to install three fountain lights in the pond, um, which is located um, at the corner of Winemaker and uh, Vineyard Haven. Um, there is and has been some concern, safety concerns um, revolving around how dark that area gets at night, and it is a winding road. Um, so the um, intended goal is to enhance both the safety and the um, aesthetics of this uh, fountain. Um, in addition to the fountain lighting, the plan is to install new plants to re replace several um, disease and dead um, plants in that area that's pictured um, primarily in that area in the bottom left hand side of your screen. Um, this application also um, involves a number of volunteer hours for landscaping, um, which is very appreciated, um, but the neighbors are planning on doing all the landscaping themselves. So um, lots of um, volunteer hours there. Um, the total amount requested is $4,992. Um, staff is generally supportive of this request as well. However, is um, recommending the same alternatives to Cortona um, here. Uh, so the hydrangeas that are proposed, um, we're recommending alternatives such as Baptista, the bottle bush, Buckeye, elderberry, red, red twig dogwood, excuse me, and Judd viburnum. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions and the applicant is in attendance for this one as well. Does the applicant want to uh, speak to any of this issue? Hello, um, this is Cindy Barrera. Can you hear me okay? <laughs> yes, we can. Thank okay. you, Cindy. Uh, yes, um, this is a area that is sorely in need of improvement. Beneath those trees at one time, prior to uh, my husband and I living in Savona, which has been seven years, there were 30 some thriving hydrangea that all became diseased and were cut down. And what we have now are stumps um, there and rather than go to the expense of trying to grind those up and remove them working with the landscaper they've made recommendations of plants that we can put around them as those continue to disintegrate um, and and bring them back to life bring those that whole bed area back to life this is I will note step one and hoping again to ask next year for additional monies as Chase recommended or mentioned um, in the more northern pond um, to improve that as well. This area at night is really dangerously dark. And unfortunately, I don't know how familiar you are with Savona, but we have power lines that drape across it. And so the original developer um, did not include in that street lights or anything to that effect. And certainly as the cooler weather comes and our evenings um, get darker much sooner, that becomes a treacherous turn in there with cards sliding and you can see skid marks along the banks of that there. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And you know, I got, I, I guess, did Claudia type this up because uh, along with all the applicants tonight, there's a really good analysis of everything that's going to happen. And uh, 
the re staff recommendation. So I don't know whether you, who, who did this, whether that was part of your efforts, Chase, but uh, it's very comprehensive. And yeah, Chase, Chase did type this up with the help from um, myself and then also our landscape architect over in Parks. Yeah, no, it's, it's really helpful and it's going to expedite this whole thing. Uh, thank you. Well, thank you. Comments from Chris? And Chris? I would only echo your last comments, John, about the hydrangea being the little lime, the paniculata little lime. It, it likely would be okay. I, I would probably stay away from the red twig dogwoods in an exposed area like this with poor soils. Um, but I, you know, I, I hate to see us use the same plant material over and over to do the bottle brush buckeye again, but the Jedi Viburnum would be very nice there too and have a, a great fragrant spring bloom. So if I were going to sub out those, I probably wouldn't go back to the bottle brush buckeye. I'd probably go to the Jedi Viburnum, but those are details y'all can work out. Chris, do you think the Maurice Tomentosum, that's one of my favorite Viburnums because there's double flowering on the bract. Do you think, you know, any problem with those in deer? No, I, I, there are very few viburnums have any problem with deer. So I think those, that would be a, a lovely one too. I only mentioned the Jedi because that was what was in the staff report. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, other comments? I, I have nothing to add. I would just say, Chris, you had me at Jedi. <laughs> <laughs> That's fun. Oh, too funny. All right. And the only other thing I, I was just, I saw Shasta Daisies, uh, and, you know, there's a plant that I absolutely love. I think it's the best perennial in the world for uh, perennials. And that's the, uh, any one of the dwarf cat mints. The deer hate them. You can cut them off with a weed whacker. They come up, they keep on blooming. They bloom all summer. Uh, they actually start blooming during the, the week of the tournament, usually. And yeah. just a great plant. So Shasta daisies, you get two or three weeks of bloom out of them. Cat mints will bloom all season and they awesome. will not affect be affected by deer. So just, just another suggestion, maybe if, if uh, the staff would include that. That'd the be Shastas great. can be invasive too. They'll, they will not stay where you plant them. They will, they will creep and take over. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's true. Okay. Uh, with no more uh, questions, is there a motion to recommend approval? So moved. I'll second. Okay, we need a uh, roll call vote. So, uh, Chris? Yes. Andy? Yes. John? Yes. Okay, well, thank you very much. Again, thank you for your effort, Cindy. Um, this is going to be great. And I think I'm going to enjoy driving by here and see the pond lit at night. I yes. think it's a big improvement. We're very excited about it. Thank you for your time. No, and thanks, you know, we all need a little romance and nothing like night lighting to add to that. <laughs> Especially in the world climate. So true. Yep. Thank you. No, thank you again for your efforts. Okay, our next uh, is Tartan Ridge. Yeah, so um, Tartan Ridge, uh, this is located in between Tartan Ridge Boulevard and Glacier Ridge Elementary School along Glacier Ridge Boulevard. Um, so you can see an example of those existing conditions in the bottom left-hand side of your screen. Um, the proposal is to remove the existing <laughs> Bailey Compact Cranberry, which um, is on both the north and south sides of the, the proposal is to replace the Bailey Compact Cranberry with Regal Privet, which you can see in the um, top right-hand side of your screen. Um, so the request here is for $5,000 um, and staff is supportive of this application as well um, without any recommendations. Uh, landscape staff was actually very supportive of the use of Regal Privet. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions you all may have and the applicant for this one is also in attendance. Oh, great. Thank you. Does the applicant wish to say anything about the project? Yeah, it's Rich Wolf here, John. How are you? Hi, Rich. How are you? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for taking, you know, listening to this uh, or, you know, handling our application here. As you, as you know, um, in Tartan Ridge, we have, we spend about 83% of our annual budget on landscaping. Uh, we maintain 50, almost 53 acres of city owned property. And we also have these uh, hedgerows to deal with, which I think are unique within, uh, within Dublin. So we normally budget between eight and $10,000 a year 
that we spend annually just to replace dead, you know, dead shrubs throughout the neighborhood. But this year, uh, as, as the pictures depict, all of those uh, Bailey compact cranberries along uh, Glacier Ridge Boulevard, uh, we, we need to replace all of them on that road. And it, we've also determined that we have the same variety on the um, Wilton, Wilton Chase and the Harlan uh, Court part uh, of the property. So that's another couple hundred, uh, couple hundred uh, shrubs. So the total for the project to do all of to just do all of uh, Glacier Ridge Boulevard is twenty thousand dollars. To do half of the ones on on uh, Wilton Chase Harlan Court are about ten thousand dollars. So this project is about thirty thousand dollars altogether. Uh, we had budgeted for the first time a reserve since the HOA has taken over here, and and we we voted the board voted at our last meeting to take that twenty thousand dollars of reserve and because we weren't aware that this was gonna, you know, that we were gonna have the, uh, the grant this year, we, we elected to take the $20,000 and do what we could um, to replace as many shrubs as we could on our dime, essentially. And what we had planned to do is half of Tartan Ridge or half of Glacier Ridge Boulevard and about uh, half of uh, what we need to do on Wilton Chase and Harlan Court um, and now having this extra $5,000 will allow us to do a little bit more, but it still won't allow us to replace all of the shrubs uh, that we need to replace. So what we may have to do is, is budget next year to replace the, the rest of them. We also talked to Chase uh, and the team over there about looking at an option of green velvet boxwoods along with the uh, Regal Privet, which was approved. So we're out for bids. Uh, we did receive one bid, which was a $20,000 one. Uh, we've, we've asked two other people to, to quote on it, but they won't quote on it unless we guarantee that they'll have our landscaping contract next year. <laughs> so, so we've had to go out and look for additional bids. I mean, they, this, you know, we, we spend just on the landscaping, as I said, about uh, $130,000 a year. That's what our budget is of $156,000 that we have for operating expense. So it's a significant portion and, and, uh, we have one contractor that's been doing a good job, but you know uh, we, we want to go out and bid that every year. But um, uh, you know, so we've gone out for bid with the contractor that's doing our landscaping now, and he's given us the bid for this twenty thousand. But we're trying to get bids both on the green velvet boxwoods and the Bailey Compact cranberry, so we, that we have a mix. Uh, part of the concern we had too, after looking at this, is that the the um, Regal Privet are actually on Wilton Loop right behind Glacier Ridge Boulevard. So we're thinking that uh, we may want to look at the green velvet boxwood so we don't have regal privet on two parallel roads just for aesthetic reasons. But we're looking to get the bids and, and once we get the bids, we'll decide how to allocate the money. But uh, we are going to allocate, we are going to spend our $20,000. If we get this $5,000 from the city, that will help, but it's not going to replace, it, it, we still will not be able to replace all of the Bailey compact cranberries in the in the plan, so we're going to have to allocate some more money next year to do some more of it. So it's uh, it's just a significant expense for the for the HOA, and uh, as I said, and this is on top of the uh, eight thousand dollars that we're spending this year on replacing other shrubs in the neighborhood. So it's a significant expense for us. You know, Rich, I think you and I have talked about all the efforts you guys put in up there, and, and it is much appreciated. This. Uh, architectural amenity of these uh, street hedges are really pretty neat for the neighborhood. And I think uh, after reading this report, I think your plant selection is probably pretty wise. Uh, and with that, I'd like to ask, see if Andy has any comments on this. No comments or questions. Chris? I just have a couple questions. Um, Mr. Wolf, did anyone look at these to determine why these uh, compact Cranberry bush viburnum failed. Yeah, we've had several people come by, and the city actually—I can't remember if it was Chase or if it was Brian—that have come by. It's just that these things are not that hardy for this particular um, environment. They're not—they're not as hardy as some of the other varieties that we have here. And we've—we've, we've, you know, over the what the ten years now that we've been in here, we have replaced those over time. But but it just seems that there's so many of them 
that we haven't replaced that all of a sudden they're just dying all at once. And, and Glacier Ridge Boulevard, if you drive down, it just looks horrible. I, I think um, uh, Ms. Riedler can, can uh, attest to the condition of her street on Wilton, Wilton Chase and Harlan Court. It's the same thing. It just seems like this year, I think they're about, most of them are four years old now and they all seem to be dying at the same time. So it's not that we haven't replaced any of these over the years, we have, but, but we've decided that instead of just replacing these piecemeal, because there are so many that are in need of replacement at this time, that we're just gonna replace all of them and just do it with a hardier variety. Well, I think the privet and the boxwood are both great selections. The privet's gonna get large. Um, so that, that's going to be uh, a, a bit of a challenge. Um, mm -hmm. Those will get quite a bit taller than the, obviously it's the compact cranberry bush viburnum that was selected initially for its smaller stature. So. Mm -hmm. Just eyes wide open going in, the regal privet is going to be quite a bit larger than what the cranberry bush ever would have been on its best day. Um, you know, I, I see a lot of failed plant material around and frequently it's due to one of two things that their installation depth is too deep uh, and then that there is too much uh, of the mulch that's a dyed mulch that's placed on top and it really strips the nutrient value of what's available to the plant material. So, you know, it, it's way outside of our purview, but if I wanted this to be really successful, I'd probably do a quick soil sample of what you have there and uh, identify what what you, what nutrients might be lacking in the soil uh, because shouldn't have had a mass failure. Uh, and John can chime in if he wants, but to have a mass failure of a hedge like that is um, indicative of, of some systemic problem. Yeah, it's, it's been deteriorating. They've been deteriorating over time. I said, we've got two streets of this. Uh, the Regal Privet is, is on Wilton Chase right behind Glacier Ridge Boulevard. And we know how big those get. And those have been relatively healthy. And, and the uh, Green Velvet Boxwoods, mine are 10 years old. I haven't replaced a single one in 10 years. And, and we're using the same contractor. We're using the same mulch because it's, it's you know, they do the whole neighborhood. We, we pay for the mulching of all those hedgerow beds every year. So it's, you know, it's, it's being done the same way on all properties. And it's just that these, uh, it just seems like this year, uh, the, these uh, Bailey compact cranberries are just, uh, just going, everything else seems to be doing fine, except for the, you know, regular replacements. It seems like we replace maybe 10 to 20% of the shrubs every year. You know, it just seems to be a standard number and it seems to be very consistent, but these, we, we just decided that we need to do something better than the, the compact cranberry. They just don't seem to be an appropriate shrub for, for this environment. You know, I applaud the fact that you guys are um, putting the effort in this because, you know, when you're looking at the kind of design you have along, the, it really, re really reminds me of a picket fence where the pickets have been kicked out. And uh, you guys have been uh, religious in trying to uh, replace those. And uh, I, got, I agree with Chris too. I really like, um, Regal privets, sort of interesting to see privets reintroduced re because in the Victorian days, that's what formed the hedge around houses about out where you were. This regal privet, though, I, I think you can keep it controlled and cut down with, you know, continual maintenance. So it's sort of fun to see that plant coming back and it is really tough. Um, any other comments from the committee? So <clears throat> do we have a motion for approval? So no move. A second. Second. Okay, thank you. Um, and of course we need a uh, roll call vote. So um, Chris? Yes. Andy? Yes. And myself, yes. So uh, thank you again. Uh, thanks for all the hard work up there, Rich. I know you guys maintain a huge amount of area and I know it's expensive. Uh, you have an absolutely lovely neighborhood and uh, again, appreciate your dedication. So thank you again. And thank you very much. We appreciate your attention. Thank you. All right, our next uh, applicant is uh, Woods of Indian Run. Yeah, so this is located at the um, intersection of Kaufman Road and Forest Run Drive, um, primarily to the south of the entry feature there um, into the neighborhood. <clears throat> so the proposal here is to replace um, a number of diseased and removed balsam fir and white pine trees along Kaufman Road, 
Um, they've kind of created, the loss of them has created uh, several bare open spaces um, where they would not have originally been. Um, so the, app here, or the proposal here is for um, 20 arborvitae and two burning bush to kind of fill in those gaps and bare spots um, alongside Coffin Road. Um, the amount requested is $4,180. Um, staff is supportive of this application um, with the recommendation that the applicant um, work with staff on um, location um, when time comes to plant them. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions and the applicant for this application is also in attendance. Uh, is there any com uh, comments from the applicant, please? <clears throat> Yeah, hi, this is Troy Ursham. I live at 7128 Timberview in Woods of Indian Run. And um, I've lived in this neighborhood five years. And uh, just, I know that that curb appeal, it's a one entrance in and along that that line to the, especially to the south, there was, you know, it was beautiful and years years ago when it was just lined with huge trees and they unfortunately had to be removed. Um, some of the ones to the very south of the, the Alton mulch bed are still there, but uh, there is a tremendous um, bare spot um, just to the north of those large trees. So, you know, looking at the, the neighbors there on Starkey's Court, there's just, there's a lack of privacy there. And, and I'm, you know, working with Chase, um, on looking at what, and, and our, our landscaper about what type of, um, you know, tree from, you know, the balsam fir and the, uh, the white pine, unfortunately were diseased. And, and I think we were looking at that green giant as being, you know, one that could be hardy and um, would fill that gap for us. Sounds like a plan. Uh, comments from the committee? Uh, this is Chris, you're up. That looks great. That, that, that'll be really nice. I'm assuming you're not using one of the uh, compact or build tight of the arborvitae, one of the more loose habit ones, but it'll look wonderful. Andy? Any yeah, comment? I'm very familiar with um, this area. It's uh, practically across the street from my house and I've seen the transformation over the past maybe three or four years where those trees had to come come down and uh, um, to Mr. Ursham's point the, those folks that back up to Kaufman Road lack a lot of privacy right now you can basically see right into their their backyard so I think this would be a wonderful upgrade thank you you know it's interesting because you know over the years and I don't know how the white pines got in there but I mean going back as early as 1980 here we tried to keep white pines probably out as a screening element because they have a way of gapping between the whirls. And uh, so I'm sort of surprised, you know, I don't know how that happened that we ended up with those. But um, yeah, I think this is going to be a big improvement. Um, and, uh, you know, for both people, really, the people living in the homes and the people coming down the road, uh, they're going to uh, see uh, quite, a, quite a change. So I'm, I'm totally with it. Um, is there a motion to recommend? So so, okay. Lady <laughs> first. Okay, you're a gentleman, Andy, and you're seconding this? I'll second. Okay, and then uh, we need to call for a vote, roll call, roll call vote. So, uh, Andy, we'll let you go first. Well, since you were yeah. a gentleman, we're going <laughs> to. Yes, thank you. Uh, Chris? Yes. Yes, and myself, yes. So that concludes tonight's Thanks, afternoon. Thanks, Troy. Good to see you. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Yeah, hey, thank you. And um, uh, that concludes the first portion of our meeting. And we'll be moving on to the uh, second portion. Uh, again, thanks, um, Chase and Claudia and the whole team. You've done a great job as usual. And uh, uh, I'm looking forward to see these improvements. I think every, every, every time we have these meetings, the team, um, we're always impressed of the uh, uh, the changes that are coming. And I'm always impressed by the energy of the people that step out and do this for the uh, good of the neighbors. So again, Tell thank me. you. And, thank uh, you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Let's move on to uh, the next phase of tonight's meeting. And we're going to discuss potential short-term rental regulations and restrictions. And I see our city attorney ready to introduce this topic. So if you would like to lead out, please do. Absolutely. Thank you, Chair Reiner. Um, tonight, as you mentioned, we're here to discuss the potential regulation of short-term rentals 
You'll recall that we've been before the committee um, before, but this topic has been referred back for further consideration. Um, so tonight we're going to provide you with a list of potential options for discussion and look forward to working with you tonight towards a recommendation for city council. So Thad Boggs from my office is going to handle the presentation for us tonight and he is with us um, listed. So Thad, if you wanna take it away. Great, thank you, Jennifer. And uh, good evening, everyone. I'm going to share my screen here and get our presentation before you. <clears throat> Okay, so as Jennifer mentioned, um, this is something that both this committee and the full council have uh, discussed and received public comment on toward the end of 2019 and at the very beginning of this year um, prior to uh, referring it back to this committee and having a, a period of pause here while we dealt with uh, getting back on track with the COVID pandemic. Uh, you have been provided with a revised memorandum that rather than proposing specific legislation at this point provides several um, options for your consideration and discussion and potential recommendation to uh, the whole of city council as you can see this is not something that has uh, um, just started over the last few months it actually goes back nearly three years now uh, when the community started to see some issues popping up with the short-term rentals that uh, started to appear in the community uh, and, and regularly revisiting it, continuing the study because this is uh, still a relatively new industry, not something where a lot of case law has uh, matriculated its way through the court system and something where we're sort of looking as well at what other communities are, are doing. So the options that we have identified for you this evening, uh, based both on our own research and on the comments that were given at the January city council meeting are laid out in front of you. There are seven, um, as you can see, and we'll go through each one of them in a little bit more detail and kind of prime the pump of discussion on each one. First of all, and, and perhaps uh, uh, closest to maintaining the status quo, not something that would require legislation per se, is providing a policy that would provide certain expectations for residents or other property owners that are renting properties on, uh, on a short-term basis within the city of Dublin. So doing some proactive outreach to people that uh, we see have posted on one of the popular hosting platforms, whether that be Airbnb or VRBO or, or any other one that might come along in the future. And then uh, working through code enforcement and, and a complaint driven process to have some heightened attention to them while enforcing existing provisions of the city code. Uh, second option would be uh, what we have discussed when the draft ordinance was in front of you back at the end of 2019, a registration requirement so that each property has to go through a, at least some city process and initiate contact themselves, uh, get on the city registration so that they are on the radar and that also provides an opportunity for the city to uh, share its expectations and uh, collect the transient occupancy tax that is already within the code and under the text of the code would, would apply to short-term rentals. Option number three, and this uh, came out more prominently in the January 6th discussion of city council, of the whole of city council was uh, to distinguish between hosted versus un unhosted short-term rentals. Uh, hosted rentals being those where the property owner or, 
or occupant if it's a, a rental occupant on a long-term lease would have to be physically present in the property uh, when they are renting it out on a short-term basis. Uh, so rather than perhaps renting out an entire home, it would be renting out rooms within the home with that resident uh, staying there on the theory that with the resident there who has a permanent stake in the community, they would be more likely to self-police issues like noise, overcrowding, parking, uh, and other disturbances that have been reported by neighbors of some of these properties. Uh, and that is not unprecedented at all. The city of Santa Monica, California uh, has a, a registration requirement, um, but prohibits unhosted uh, rentals. So they don't cap the number of nights that a person can have a hosted rental, but there are zero nights on which a person can have an unhosted rental. And uh, likewise with the city of Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, the unlimited rentals are only allowed if they are, uh, if the occupant is there or if it's adjacent to their property. So not only are those examples of places that have used the hosted versus unhosted distinction, but they also illustrate that none of these options um, really operates in a silo. Uh, it, would, it would make sense perhaps to have two or three on the menu that, that could be pursued if short-term rental specific regulation is desired. Another component that was in the ordinance that was drafted at the end of 2019 and discussed at this committee and council was to have an absolute cap on the number of nights that a property could be um, rented on a short-term basis. The cap that was chosen when this was last discussed was a 14 night per calendar year. So not necessarily on a consecutive basis, but during uh, the course of a year, any 14 nights. That 14 number is not really a magic number. It could be any reasonable number that the, um, or any number that the council found to be reasonable. And there was uh, some diversity of opinion among uh, your colleagues on council when this was discussed in January. Option five is uh, to prohibit the short-term rentals in certain zoning districts. Uh, one approach that has been used is to create an overlay district that allows short-term rentals. So it's not, it wouldn't just limit them to uh, commercial districts per se or uh, residential districts, but could be set atop the current zoning as sort of a secondary layer and further regulate appropriate places for this type of operation to locate. Uh, number six, and, and this is probably one that doesn't work so well in concert with other options, is to prohibit them altogether. Um, that is something that is within the, the city's power to do as, a, as a, a regulation and something that the city of Upper Arlington enacted at the beginning of 2019. Uh, to my knowledge, there has not been a prosecution uh, through their mayor's court or, or municipal court for violation of that. Uh, there has been, I'm told, some investigation of complaints, but uh, nothing that had risen to the level of a citation. Uh, so certainly an option and, and would not be unprecedented in central Ohio. And lastly, uh, just a simple maintenance of the status quo. There are currently no short-term rental specific ordinances on our books, but there are ordinances relative to uh, excessive noise, uh, parking restrictions, number of vehicles that may be stored in a driveway, for example, and other sort of quality of life or nuisance issues that can be addressed under the existing code and uh, may not be specific to short-term 
rentals themselves. Also, when we last uh, spoke about this in front of council, there was a concern expressed um, by the corporate, uh, a representative of the corporate housing industry. And we had prepared uh, an amendment that would define short-term rentals so as to exclude that type of use, uh, that type of activity, which was not really targeted when this concern was brought to council. Uh, so that is something that we believe we can adequately address if, if this committee and if council wants to move forward with regulations. And so with that, um, I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have, or at least attempt to answer them, and um, turn it back over to, to you. Okay. Um, does any of the uh, people on our uh, committee have any questions for the law department? Chris, Andy? Wanna, Andy? I don't have any questions. I'm, I'm anxious to hear what some of the uh, residents or constituents have to say. Uh, I certainly have some thoughts, but I'm uh, would would look forward to hearing those. Okay, Chris. I would agree with Andy. Pardon? I would agree with Andy. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, just out of point of clarification for tonight's discussion, um, want to uh, sort of set some standards here. Um, please wait to be recognized, and um, please stay on mute until you are recognized. And if you would keep your comments brief tonight, it'd be much appreciated. Um, and that I think is what we need to know. So um, if, uh, let's see here, who was our first person? Uh, looks like Bob Fathman would like to uh, comment. Bob, you're being recognized by the chair. Please go ahead, sir. Thanks very much, Sean, and uh, members of the committee. I, I'm here representing the Muirfield Homeowners Board. I'm president of that board. Just we don't have a formal position on this, but I can tell you that over the last few years, the issue has come to the fore through resident complaints and our board has discussed it. We were meeting with our legal counsel about seeing what we could do to put some restrictions on back a long time ago when we learned that you all were looking at this and we thought, well, we're not gonna reinvent the wheel. We'll wait and take a step back, see what the city does. So we would like to see you do something. I mean, we'd like to see some restriction. I think the key thing for us is that um, PGA tour events be somehow excluded or exempted or waived because as you can imagine, you know, there are a lot of people within our neighborhood who like to rent their homes out to, for things like that. We do have problem residents who have rent, who are absentee landlords who never live in the home of at least two of those that I'm aware of who rent the homes out and we get complaints about noise and parties and you know just a, a turnover and the homes aren't cared for like they are when somebody lives there. That's a rarity, that's two out of 2,400 homes. Um, mostly the problem isn't very common, but uh, anyway, we're, we're happy that you're discussing it and I like seeing all those options. Option six did not appeal to me, the Upper Arlington one of you know, not allowing anything because we do want to allow it for PGA tour events. Bob, I have a, a quick question. Um, you said for PGA tour events, is that a seven day cycle, 10 days, two weeks? How do you, how, how does Mirfield and people that rent these homes feel about that? What's the time? Well, you know, this year was different because of the pandemic. So for the first time ever, there was two tournaments back to back uh, and so it stretched over a two week period. In fact, two homes on my street, and I don't live really proximate to the course at all. I actually live west of Muirfield Drive, but two homes on my street rented out two golfers themselves for a two week period. Uh, those were people that were optimistic that they would make, make both, uh, both events. You, but we've had the Solheim Cup, we've had the Ryder Cup, we've had the President's Cup, and of course we always have the Memorial Tournament. So generally speaking, it's a one week event for the Memorial Tournament, but from time to time, um, Jack is able to host another event at the, at the uh, course. The ones I just mentioned are clear examples. So overall, I've never known it, I've lived here 29 years, never known it to be more than two weeks in an entire year. Yeah, but I, you know, for per event, say that we get the Solheim Cup back and we get, you know, we have Jack's normal tournament 
it, it are you referring to seven days rental yeah. is, is the, with seven that days event. seven days is what you would do okay yes. thank thank you very much and thank you for uh, taking the time to uh, participate tonight uh, let's see where our next speaker is we can see a picture of them and let's see here Peter O'Neill Pete could you speak please Hi, thanks, uh, John. I really appreciate it. So Peter O'Neill and Turnberry Court, Dublin, Ohio. Um, so just a couple of comments. I, I realize I'm early in the speakers tonight, but I, I do believe from the past presentations, and I believe that we'll see it again tonight, um, you, you won't get heavy representation from Dublin residents in something like this. But if you were to go out and survey the community, you know, 99% of the people do not want to live next to an Airbnb. They do not want one. Um, I have the unfortunate experience of being between two Airbnb rentals. Fortunately, one of them sold uh, since our last discussion. So that that situation has gotten somewhat better. But the, you know, it, it just doesn't affect most Dublin residents until they're next to one. And when I talk to my friends and other Dublin residents, they're kind of shocked that Dublin has no regulations about these. So I think your tonight will be similar to past meetings. You know, the people who benefit economically from having an Airbnb uh, rental are going to be overrepresented in a situation like this. Um, I was also a little surprised when I checked with the city. Um, you know, there is ordinances in place about, uh, you know, running a business out of your home. Um, and for whatever reason, this is considered separate and this is being considered separate. Um, in some ways, I guess that might be good, but um, I don't know. It was, that was a little surprising because that those, uh, those standards seem to address noise, parking, safety, the things that, you know, directly affected my family. Um, so I didn't see why we couldn't pretty much just enforce you know, this did not appear to be a business that can be run in a residential area per current code, but apparently there is some disagreement on that. Um, so, uh, you know, as, as a resident, as someone who's had to live next to one, um, you know, I vote for strong regulation. Uh, I am in Mirrorfield. Uh, I certainly sympathize with the homeowners who rent for the tournament. Um, so seven or 14 days, I, I guess I'd have no problem with that. Golfers are quite a bit different than, you know, the people who were, uh, who were renting next to us. And, um, so that's, uh, just, uh, but I really think if you were to survey the community, it wouldn't even be close as to people who are in favor of, uh, highly regulating Airbnbs. Thank you, John. Okay, thank you. Uh, committee members, any questions you have for Peter? Hearing none, I will we'll move on to our next uh, person. Uh, Mr. Warren Fishman, please. Warren, can you hear us? I can hear you. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Yes, please go ahead. We, visually, we can't see you, but we can hear you, I believe. Okay, I don't know why you can't see me, but start my video. Let's see what happens here. Yeah, done that. There we are. There. Okay. There you go. Okay. Can you hear me now too? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Okay, I'll be really brief. I won't uh, uh, hash over what I discussed before. I've worked, uh, uh, volunteered with Dublin for over forty years to to uh, uh, with with uh, several of the people uh, on council uh, to uh, have a good enforceable ordinances to keep the quality of life good in 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 Dublin. Um, uh, I don't think this is any exception. Um, uh, I've had the, I live across the street from Peter. Uh, we've uh, tolerated the Ubers and so on. Uh, somebody mentioned to me um, that, well, why don't you call the police? Uh, I was on, as you know, John, the Muirfield board for 40 years, and people are very reluctant to call the police on their neighbors, okay? It, it does not create goodwill among, among neighbors. So. Um, uh, the other thing I, I was I wanted to bring up, um, we talked about 14 days. Um, I think you have to have those 14 days no shorter 
then two, not days, but weeks, like two weeks you're allowed. Because if you do 14 days, nobody's going to be able to keep track of, of when those people stayed there. You know, they said, oh, I only have, I've only had 13 so far. I had, you know, one each month. And so I, I think that's something to think about. Um, also, though, I think that, that um, uh, Peter's point is well taken, and I won't repeat it exactly, but um, I've had several calls. I had calls today even when people, that, that must be on the website or something, there was a meeting today and, and, and uh, talked about it. I, I have talked to nobody who doesn't have a financial interest in having an Airbnb that wants one within 10 doors of their house, okay? Uh, and I've talked to a lot of people over the last couple of years. Um, and if you've had one, which a couple of, of, of you people have, uh, you'll know that it, it does not uh, make your neighborhood more attractive. And, and, and it, it, it's, it's uh, um, I, I think to tell a story on, on, on somebody, uh, uh, I may have told you before that their daughter came into their mother and said, mom, there's, there's a guy sleeping in our hammock, you know, and, and uh, especially when you have small children, you've got strangers running around, uh, most of the houses in Muirfield are, are in Dublin generally are, are good size houses, four bedrooms, two and a half baths, which can accommodate a lot of people if you're just coming for a family reunion for the weekend. And uh, the house that was just sold um, had family reunions up to 30 or 40 people and, and that were on the bike paths and people's neighbor's yards, Ubers coming in and out. So I, I, I think that that as I said, as a guy that's been involved in Dublin for 40 years and, 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 and fought with you guys to keep Dublin great and keep the ordinances in, in uh, have ordinances that keep the quality of life up. And, and, and also most important, one of the wonderful things about Dublin is we have uh, a, 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 a citizen input. And I think if, if you could get, uh, pull every resident in Dublin it'd be overwhelming that they don't want a, 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 an Airbnb a 10 doors from a house. Now, what I, I, I don't know if I should bring this up, but what I do think since I've been involved in zoning so long that I think there's places for Airbnbs in Dublin. I think in, in, in Bridge Street, uh, uh, Bridge Park, um, in commercial areas, I think the ordinance should apply strictly to residential neighborhoods. I think if it's a mixed use um, uh, 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 part of town, that's a mixed. That's part of a mixed use. I think that that would be fine. So I think it should apply to residential. I think it be, should be a minimum of seven consecutive days, not a day, fourteen days throughout the year. Okay, and that's all I have to say. And thank you very much for listening to me. Okay, thank you, Warren. Uh, let's see, Raymond Lee's name popped up here. Yes, hello. Yeah, Raymond. Can, okay, great. We can hear you. Uh, okay. Well, thank you. Um, I'm just going to be very brief, but I'm going to be one of the homeowners that does you. That I really think this is very broad regulation and prohibiting broad conduct of a problem. Problems with Airbnb rentals, then the conduct that is a problem creates. Uh, should be outlawed because it doesn't matter whether it's Airbnb or otherwise. For example, how many cars can be in a driveway? It doesn't really matter whether that's Airbnb. If there's too many cars in a driveway, you prohibit that. And all I'm saying is we take we should take the same approach to Airbnb rental. Um, for the pro prohibit the problems, but in Airbnb is not inherently a problem. There can be problems associated with it. I'm a problem instead of the broad uh, prohibition. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Rochelle Krieber. Might need, might need a second to connect you up there. Can you hear? Can you? Can you? Uh, Rochelle, can you hear us? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes, we can. Uh-huh. Please go ahead. So um, we live in a community where we have a hosted rental. And um, I'd like to point out that we have the same problems as the unhosted rentals. 
Um, we still have a lot of street traffic, whether it be Ubers or private autos. Uh, we have a lot of parking on the streets. Um, I happen to share a driveway with the, um, the Airbnb. And so I get a lot of people walking up and down my driveway and on occasion mistaking my home for the Airbnb hmm. in the middle of the night. Um, I do agree that it should be someone else had pointed out rather than it being a 14 day if they decide to go with um, limiting the number of days rather than 14 days, make it two weeks. Because I think it would be hard to keep track of the days one by one. Um, and, I, and I think the bottom line is an Airbnb is basically a business. And, um, and it doesn't help the property value. Had I known that there was an Airbnb next to me, I would not have purchased my home three years ago. And I wonder if at some point, when you go to sell your home, we'll have to disclose if we live next to an Airbnb. And that really would affect our property values in a negative way. And um, I urge each council member before they vote to ask themselves if they would knowingly purchase a home that is next to an Airbnb. Is, it, is there anything else you'd like to say? I can't think of anything at this time. Okay. Well, thank you for your testimony. It's uh, much appreciated. And all of us, of course, are going to be taken into consideration. Um, uh, Amanda Ryan, can you hear us? Yes. Hello. Yes. I, I am. Yeah, no, we can hear you. I am here to represent um, the corporate housing industry, which was addressed. And, um, you know, I appreciate hearing that um, it seems like there can be exceptions made in order to not interfere with our business. So I really don't have anything to add until, you know, um, until I guess the planning is in further development. Okay. All right. You know, I think uh, I think uh, a really good case was made for that, and, and I think uh, City Council and the staff understands the importance of that. And I'm I'm sure there's uh, corporate housing would be excluded. It's a very important part of our uh, commercial aspects. Uh, seeing that people uh, get taken care of as as they're brought into the area to be introduced to our uh, or just part of the corporation to be introduced to uh, our our uh, business our business group. So no, thank you. Anything else, Amanda? Nope, that's all, thank you. Okay, next up is Brent Swander. Good evening, uh, Chair Reiner, Mayor, uh, Council Member Keeler, thanks for the opportunity. So I, I also live in Mirfield and I do not have any interest in any short-term rentals, um, financial or otherwise. Uh, I actually have, long, I have a long-term rental. Um, I am here to speak in favor of either option one, two, or seven. <clears throat> I think that you all have taken a very deliberative approach to this, which is, is reasonable. Um, I have a seven month old child. I have a almost three year old child. I would welcome an Airbnb. I am a user of Airbnbs. We use them on vacation. Um, <clears throat> I think that there are some legitimate concerns. Trespassing would be a very legitimate concern, correct? Um, I think that there are a couple other ones. Um, we helped draft the Columbus model. And I think that is a model in which the city of Dublin should undertake. <clears throat> so when we're talking about setting expectations in option one, I think option two, the registration is probably a better model because uh, to Mr. O'Neill's point, you could then revoke the registration. If these problems persist, you can revoke the registration. Um, and I think that's important. We're talking about six to 10, maybe eight rentals, short-term rentals uh, in Dublin <clears throat> overall. And there are problem children in every industry, in every profession. Uh, option seven is, as Mr. Boggs pointed out, the issues can be addressed with existing resources. 
So I think the city has a tough challenge here of balancing the rights of private property rights, um, the city's desires and neighbors' concerns. Um, <clears throat> you know, I live on Lockmore Court. There are mornings when I can't get up my street because neighbors are parked on both sides of the street. This isn't a short-term rental problem. And the issues that are being talked about aren't unique. I think Mr. Boggs also uh, addressed this, aren't unique uh, to short-term rentals. These are long-term rentals, they're mm -hmm. owner-occupied, they're multi-single family. Um, I moved to Dublin four years ago. My wife's family is from here. Um, I welcome folks to explore our downtown, shop in our restaurants, eat, or eat in our restaurants, shop at our uh, in our shops and visit our community. We have a lot to be proud of. Um, when we stay in short-term rentals on vacation, um, we get to know the neighbors. Um, it's important and we welcome that opportunity. Um, the Columbus public hearings, what we heard a lot of are, yeah, there are a couple bad actors, but more importantly, these are people who are, City of Columbus held three public hearings. These are people who are relocating to Central Ohio for work and they're in short-term housing. They're visiting loved ones in hospitals or they're coming here for college graduations. Um, but there are bad actors and issues that need to be addressed. I think those issues can be addressed through a registration process. I would even go as far as say a registration fee that are commensurate with uh, administrative costs uh, on behalf of the city. So I think as you continue to move forward, um, I hear concerns. I think the limitation of days is, is not reasonable. Um, and I would, because it's, it's just too tough to enforce. Um, <clears throat> so moving forward with the registration, a fee and a revocation of the permit if problems persist. With that, I would take any questions. No questions. I think you're off the, the hook. Uh, next speaker is uh, Philip. <clears throat> Philip, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. I didn't know I was speaking tonight. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you don't have to really. Hey, Philip, you really don't have to. If you're just listening in, that's fine. Um, I, I am just listening in, and and I would just like to say, you know, I understand the points of of, of everyone. To be honest with you, everyone that's spoken tonight, I thought all had uh, legitimate points. Um, we ha are only in the initial stages of looking, and some of the places that we've looked at, you know, for you know, from an opportunity perspective, for us to invest in a short term rental. Uh, typically are not the ones that we're looking at typically are not in neighborhoods anyways. So uh, I, I understand all of the points that everyone had said. I would only like you to consider that, you know, this isn't like a, a Muirfield and not just Muirfield uh, instance and uh, just to um, consider all the points that everyone has made in your decision. Okay. Um, Nikki Lieb is our next speaker. I really don't have anything to say. I just wanted to listen, but I have been a long time resident of Muirfield, Dublin. Um, I just want to see us do the right thing, the parties and, you know, the 40 people at a house and things like that. I just, I hate to see that. So uh, across Dublin. So I just look forward to see what you all do. Thank you. No, thank you. Jenny, do we have any other uh, speakers waiting? Mr. Reiner, we did get a comment from the website as this discussion was going on. Okay. It is from Victoria Bork. She is requesting Dublin City Council to expressively clarify Airbnbs from party and event venues in residential areas. She would like a clarification from how many people are allowed on the property and what are the consequences to the homeowner of the Airbnb. Okie doke. Um, it Jenny, have we picked everybody else up who zoomed in? Are we okay? As far as I know, if no one else is um, asking to speak, then I think you're good. 
yeah, I really don't have anybody else on this uh, window list. Well, that moves us to. Uh, Can I make one more comment? Sure, Bob, please. Uh, I happen to think, as I was listening to the others that followed me, about uh, neighbors who don't live here anymore, but the people who used to live across the street from me did something. I don't know if it fits into the framework of what you're discussing, but they did a house swap with people in Hawaii, in Florida, in the British Isles, where that family would come here and the family across the street would go there. I don't know if any money changed hands, so maybe it doesn't fit into the definitions. We never had a problem with it. I was just amazed that there was anyone who wanted to come to Dublin like that. But people came in for a graduation from OSU, a class reunion at OSU, a retired professor lived there for a week. Um, a bridal party came in for somebody that was getting married and they were just delightfully nice people. And it enabled the couple who used to live across the street from us to go free of charge to some other places and have exotic travels. They even let them use their car sometimes when they came here, which I couldn't imagine myself doing that kind of liability. But uh, I just, I guess I'm just throwing that in the mix for you all to consider thinking about something like that. I thought it was a neat thing for somebody else to do. It has never appealed to my wife and I to give up our home like that, but others might want to. Okay, thank, thanks, Bob. Okay, now we're getting down to um, committee questions and discussion. Um, Chris, you want to lead out? Well, as I've said in all of these meetings all along, um, we once had a um, Airbnb uh, have a home on our street. Uh, it was four or five doors up from us. We live at the end of the cul-de-sac. Um, it was extremely disruptive and it was, you know, maybe it was the bad apple. Um, I don't know. We did call a number of times, um, both the Muirfield Association and the police, um, various neighbors did, but there really weren't any tools. We were, we were told at the time, and this has been 10, 11 years ago, we were told at the time that there were not any options available to the city or to us you know, to remedy this. It, it was so bad that the people that lived next door to the Verbo, when they um, when they would advertise it, they would advertise it in a community with a pool and so on and so forth. Well, the neighbor had a pool, a private pool in their backyard. And these folks would swim in their pool and they would wake up in the middle of the night and there would be people in their pool. Um, and then they would call the police and they would come for trespassing. And I just think that that was a terribly onerous thing for a neighbor to have to do in a repetitive, you know, I, I appreciate Mr. Slander's um, thoughts of, you know, canceling their, um, their opportunity for, for bad actors. Unfortunately, at that point in time, that was not something that was avail a tool available to in this community. Um, I don't, I'm not thrilled about having to have neighbors call the police on neighbors like you know, basically you're putting the, the work on the person who is law abiding to report the person that isn't. Um, because obviously like in our traffic situation, the police would circulate around and they would find the bad behaving apples and punish them appropriately. Certainly they cannot do that in a community of 50,000 people. Um, so I, I am, I am sympathetic that there are good apples. Um, and maybe I, I, I would agree that in mixed use districts, it would be very appropriate because you move into a mixed use district expecting mi a mix of uses. You move into a residential district, district and I believe your expectation is for residential use. So I had an email this past week about, um, uh, of Airbnb or or some equivalent there too that had a gender reveal party here. And um, so I talked to Chief Pice about it and there was approximately 20 cars. Uh, the police were called. I think the neighbors finally said, cried to uncle that at one o'clock in the morning and they called the police to have them come and break up this gender reveal party. Um, and from what I'm told from our chief, you know, that it broke up pretty quick after the police showed up. But, you know, that's, that is, 
um, onerous. It's, it was my understanding that this was not the first time that those neighbors had to call the police on this use. Um, so I'm very sympathetic to them and I don't think that that should part of the experience of being an individual residential homeowner in the city of Dublin. But I'd love to hear your thoughts and Andy's thoughts as well. Yeah, uh, and I think what we might wanna do uh, committee members is go down a list of these ideas and, and discuss them, um, you know, residential areas, um, the idea of two weeks during the tournament and sort of see how you can vote and maybe we can come up with a recommendation for council. So uh, Andy, do you have any comments you'd like to make? Yeah, so first of all, I'd like to thank the, the residents and folks for joining the Zoom and, and offering your thoughts and opinions and um, potential framework help with the framework here. Um, a lot of good suggestions and observations and, and um, I think from my standpoint, what I've heard is the status quo isn't going to work. Um, Chris said this, these disruptions in her neighborhood, there was really nothing that could be done. Um, if all short term rentals are required to register, potentially applicate paying uh, an application fee um, subject to fines and then termination of their rental uh, application or rental agreement, I should say, um, then you have teeth, you have me a mechanism um, to the point that there are bad apples. There can be bad apples anywhere. I, I absolutely agree. I've owned long-term rental properties myself, and I've had some of those bad apples as tenants. And most residents around the city of Dublin really have no ability to control what their neighbor does with their house. Because there is no regulation and uh, long-term rentals, there, you know, there's really nothing that a, a, a landlord has to do to make that, turn that from a primary resident residence into a rental. You just hope that they're going to be responsible and vet those tenants. Um, but I've lived across from rental properties as well here in Dublin and had to deal with some of the the fallout that that uh, you folks you residents are frustrated with so i think doing nothing status quo doesn't work we have to have rules we have to have a framework we have to understand what the what is allowed what is not allowed um as as someone that has a i guess a, a passion for helping folks that are getting up in age, empty nesters, um, folks that might be living alone. We've heard from residents that have host, hosted uh, short-term rentals in their home. And it's a sense, it gives them a, a, a sense of companionship and, and uh, just it, it's a, 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 a positive experience. And to tell a resident that they cannot have someone live in their home and pay a rent, to me, um, we're starting to, to um, tread on their, their independent property rights. Um, as I said, there's very little that, that most of us in Dublin can do in terms of uh, having a property owner rent a home, you know, a, the traditional long-term rental um, so putting something on the books that would allow us to regulate that certainly within certain neighborhoods, there may be deed restrictions in terms of the number of rentals that can be in a particular neighborhood and so on. But I'd say most Dublin residents don't have that ability. Um, you know, having, uh, parties and things like that, if, if your neighbor, goes out of town to Hawaii and they've got teenage kids, they could have a party. So, you know, those things aren't necessarily um, unique to short-term rentals. Uh, I, I just think we, it has to be regulated. I don't have an issue with unlimited hosted uh, rental days, um, application fees, fines, and ultimately termination are, are the, the way that we address the issue. Um, I, I would say in terms of 
Chris asked the question, you know, should a neighbor have to report the bad apples? Um, I would say the way it stands now, a neighbor tries to report the bad apples, but there's no means or mechanism to do anything. So at least having, uh, you know, laws or, or requirements on the books would allow those neighbors when they are uh, tired of the noise to have um, a consequence for that property, that unhosted property owner. Um, I think I, I, I agree with the, the concept of districts. Um, you know, naturally uh, Bridge Park seems like it's conducive to this kind of activity more so than say Mirfield or Hawks Nest. Um, the only issue I have is saying that uh, folks in the Mirfield district or the Memorial Tournament district can rent their homes for 14 days or two weeks if it, it, it's weeks instead of days, uh, but residents in Hawks Nest can't. I guess what I'm hearing is, and I don't know if this is the case, but if most residents would prefer not to have an Airbnb next to them, then you're never going to have anybody in Hawks Nest saying, hey, you left us out. We'd like to have 14 days. Um, so those are my thoughts. Andy, I think we run into this frequently with the Irish Fest too. I, I think that is a, um, a driver of rentals for folks in uh, neighborhoods in proximity to the festival. So I don't know that I wouldn't be supportive of giving your field an opportunity that wouldn't be citywide. So, um, because I know some folks would like to capitalize perhaps on that opportunity relative to the Irish Festival or, um, you know, maybe the 4th of July or maybe, maybe something else. I guess real quick, I would say, you know, again, anybody anywhere can rent their home unhosted, you know, you, you move out, you buy another house, you, instead of selling it, you rent it. Anybody can do that. There's really no restrictions. And, you know, the, I'd say there's a fairly good likelihood that there could be a negative outcome at some point in time along that, the life of that rental property. Um, so, uh, you know, I guess having it not be necessarily districts and open to anyone does make sense. Okay. One, one yeah. thing, if I may, uh, Ted. One thing just for uh, the committee's thought um, in, discuss in discussing these options is if, if the consensus is to pursue some kind of district-based approach uh, through the zoning, that would go through the typical zoning process as well. So there would be eyes on it at uh, both at the planning staff level as well as planning and zoning commission and then finally council. Uh, in addition to any business regulation type of proposal that would just go to council. Okay, now <clears throat> I, I, we're, we're gonna try something tonight to see if we can, two of the three of us can agree to something that we could send up to city council on this because uh, this has been an open discussion now for three years. So I, I'm, I'm gonna bring up some topics and I'd like the committee members to comment, yay, affirmative or no and see if we can uh, get some kind of information back to our legal department and to our fellow council members on uh, the different topics that have been uh, discussed tonight. So, you know, I'd like to start out with, um, how does everyone, I think, I think I know how you feel, but maybe I don't, uh, we exclude the corporate housing folks because that's an issue to himself. Is that an affirmative? We would, we, all three of us would be in agreement with that. Or is there anybody that would not be? Chris, Andy. I'm in agreement that corporate housing is excluded. Is excluded. Is that true, Chris? Is that true? I how concur. you? I okay. concur. Okay. Now let's move on to uh, the next issue, which has been a uh, old traditional issue in our community for years. And that was uh, during the golf tournament, corporations would come in, rent our houses on the golf course or almost literally anywhere anymore. Uh, we are, are we in agreement that we should continue this tradition for any PGA approved um, uh, golf 
episodes and that it would be listed as two weeks. Uh, is there any, you know, love to hear what you got to say. Uh, we're all familiar with it. I, uh, I think some of us lived out here for 30 years. So I, I guess my th only thought with that is, so, uh, you know, I, I agree that residents in, let's say, let's just start with in proximity to the golf course, they should have the ability to rent their homes, whether they rent it to a corporation. I, su I suppose there's a difference or there could be a requirement that it's rented to a corporation, not a, an individual or gaggle of people. Um, but, you know, I don't have a problem with that. I okay. guess my, where I start to think about it is, okay, so um, so we say short-term rentals are allowed for up to 14 days. If, if, if a PGA event is involved or around to accommodate guests of a PGA event, I don't know. It just seems like, um, seems very specific to me. And I would say then that it would be difficult to say, okay, it's only in the boundaries of the, the, the Mirfield Association, you know, it could be any, anybody. And then to Chris's point, what about the folks that want to rent their houses that are close to the Irish Fest? And, and then you get to the folks that don't live near either one of those, but want to rent their home either during one of those events or sometime some other time during the year. Uh, those are, the, I guess, the challenges that we have as a council in, in, you can't make everybody happy, but trying to accommodate as many people as possible. Chris, comments on, on this, please? To me, that feels like spot zoning. And I, I don't know that it's probably equitable or fair. Um, so yeah, if I could jump in, I would we would not recommend putting anything that's event tied to any sort of event. That's, you know, some people came to um, the meetings and talked about Muirfield and that was in part why the 14 days was selected to allow for that kind of accommodation for events like that, but still give flexibility for it to be used uniformly throughout the city. So we would not recommend tying this to any sort of PGA event or Irish festival, anything like that. So Jennifer, what you're saying is to allow this to happen, um, I guess a broad brush approach would be we allow anybody in the city to rent their home for, for two weeks. Uh, and that would be fair across the board. And that would cover the Mirrorfield events. It might cover the Irish Festival events. We don't really have that many big draw draw events, but um, and maybe some of the people that um, rent their house out for the uh, automotive show that we have every year. Uh, how does the committee feel about making that recommendation that we allow a, a two week um, period uh, for people to rent their homes for, for events? I mean, in a general, in a general statement, how do, how do you guys feel about that? I'm, I'm okay with it. Um, I guess, from what I'm seeing from other communities, I don't know the percentage that have legislation on the books. I'm wondering what percentage of them limit it to 14 days. 14 days, someone could say um, the 14 days was arrived at to accommodate the folks that live in Muirfield. Um, well, I, you know, I live in Bal Griffin and I want to, I want to rent my house. Why should I be limited to 14 days? Um, I'm not saying no, or I'm not, I don't know that I have an, a better alternative. It seems to me like 14 days is a little short. Again, the whole, the whole idea is we regulate it and we have teeth. That, so if someone is in their 21st day and they rent it for a week, the third week to a bad apple, uh, a report is filed and they're either fined or, you know, it's three strikes and you're out. Um, you know, so, Andy, and to be fair, yeah, the next item is going to be regulation. I'm going to ask your comments on that. 
but uh, yeah, just just these ideas, I just sort of want to throw them out and you know see if we can get an affirmative vote, you know, or a negative vote on the idea of just if you're a Dublin citizen, you can rent your house for two weeks for something, you know. Is that okay? I think those two weeks were generated because the federal government permits you to rent your primary residence for two weeks and not yep. have to report that as income. So I think that was my understanding behind the two weeks because of those federal regulations. And I think, Andy, that would be important if we went, if we went that route, that it would be important to communicate that, that we were following federal guidelines that permit you to rent your primary residence out for a period of 14 days or two weeks without having to report that as income. Now, are we, are we the committee, I, I take we are, we are in, in agreement that we are suggesting that anybody in, in the city of Dublin could rent their house out for two weeks. Does that sound fair? Like before we go to the next phase of you know, this discussion, is that okay with this? Because we have to eventually come up with some kind of guidelines to present to our colleagues that you know, we've discussed and uh, we have either negative or affirmative feelings about. So, and it surely helped the law department again after three years of, of presenting ideas and all the, all the citizens testifying. So item number two, are we in agreement that a two week rental period would be okay? I think that's what I'm, what I'm hearing. I, I, I had heard the suggestion that we not allow it in residential areas, but Mir Mirfield is a residential area. So if we want to accommodate those homes, then we have, I think we have to, to Chris's point, avoid spot zoning and just say, yes. Okay. Any, any Dublin resident, 14 days. Chris, are you affirmative on this? I could be affirmative in it depending on the, um, the, what we do with registration and how <clears throat> I would not be in favor of three strikes and you're out. I would be a, a strike in your, your first strike, you're out for 18 months. Your second strike, you're out for three years. Your third strike, you're out. Um, so that, you know, we all know how fast a year goes, right? It just flies right by. And, um, I could be in favor for that, but I am going to hold withhold that on on what the enforcement piece goes to. Okay, our next our next next topic is regulation and registration. So I'd like to hear what you think, um, how that would be done, or you know its limitations. And you just gave us an entire list of um, you know what would happen to you if you violated this. Um, and I guess I'm suggesting with you that, you know, even though it's two weeks, we want to know who's in the house, when the two weeks are, possibly a tax on the two weeks. I don't, you know, I'm not sure. So I, I just need your comp. So this gets us item number three, regulation and registration. So please, uh, let's see, um, Andy, you can lead out since Chris just finished up. Please. Yes, for, yes for registration and regulation. I think um, Santa Monica has a pretty good uh, um, framework. I haven't seen the city of Columbus's framework, but I think you know when I looked at these seven options, it wasn't an it wasn't one or the other. It was a combination of maybe four that I liked. But yes, the answer is yes, John. Okay, thank you. And Chris. Um, I, I would say I, I want sufficient teeth. I, I would like to hear more about the city of Columbus's model. Um, and maybe that's something legal can look at for us and, and give us some recommendation. Um, I, I don't want to make it. So I've lived here on my street. Uh, it, it's more than 19 years. To my knowledge, on the street that I live on, the police have only been called on an individual house a few times. Every time that they have been called to this street, there's maybe, I don't know, 25 homes on my street or so, it was for a rental unit issue. Yep. So 
I, I understand that anybody can behave badly. My experience is that the bad, the propensity of bad behavior goes up significantly when you have an Airbnb rental. Um, not that anyone can't be a bad neighbor or park on both sides of the car and not let cars pass. Certainly anybody can do that, but I think it's the frequency is greater. So, you know, in one impact of this um, VRBO and Airbnb is that really um, you bring in your soccer team, whatever, and you don't really use our hotels. You pile all the team into someone's house and all of a sudden there's 25 kids in sleeping bags and, and uh, parents dropping off people. And, you know, that, I, I get it. I mean, um, so that gets us to another topic that was discussed tonight. Should we segregate out, let's say, the historical district and, and uh, possibly Bridge Street from um, residential neighborhoods? How do you feel about that? So I guess what I'm suggesting, and I, I just want to hear your opinions, um, in, a, in the historical area in Bridge Street, and, I, and I've heard comments tonight to, uh, that were affirmative that, you know, maybe uh, in these areas, uh, there'd be more time allocated or total time allocated for uh, Airbnbs. And uh, I don't know, what's your opinion on this? What's your thinks? What's your thoughts? I mean, what do you guys I feel? would say maybe Bruce, in ahead. Bridge Street, but I probably would not in the historic district because again, that is a residential neighborhood. Okay. Um, I, you know, if someone wanted to operate a B&B &B or something like that, then they, they have different licensing they would go through that that could be permitted and i think b and b's might be very appropriate and be lovely in the historic district as long as they went through the process in order to obtain the ability to do that uh, which you know that is a very different use than i than in my opinion what these airbnb and b's and verbos are so i i would say bridge street district um, would be the district that perhaps this could take place andy Andy, <laughs> you're so. Are you asking if, in let's say Bridge Street, that instead of fourteen days, it could be thirty or more? Yes, it could be a, a time that you know we think is fair. Um, I'm sure maybe maybe again the people in Bridge Street and any and, and even over at the historical district didn't sound like we're you know some of us are interested in doing that in the historical district, which I understand. Um, you know, maybe those people too will be upset if all of a sudden, you know, there's people piling into their units uh, next door or entire soccer teams, <laughs> basketball teams or whatever. So, but I just want to see if, you know, I, my take on it was when, when you have a residential neighborhood, you expect the zoning to protect you and it was going to be residential and all of a sudden you have a commercial application right next to you and people are piling in, cars are being, you know, and everything that was discussed tonight, people swimming in your swimming pool, I've heard uh, also, you know, for a number of years about Airbnbs and the people clogging up the streets and the Uber cars dropping people off. And I think, I think there's a modicum of, of, of um, expectation when you buy a house in a residential area that you're in a residential area and not in a commercial area or not in a hotel area. So, you know, I get that. So I guess what this question is, is there other areas in your mind in our city where, you know, there'd be a lot more activity for this kind of thing. And you know, yes, I think if there was an area, it would be Bridge Park. So okay. I said, if you were going to make that either, you know, 30 days or 45 days or unlimited, I think that area is more conducive to it. I would be curious, or I would want to hear from residents, you know, if they're willing to, to, um, you know, join us and, and give us their feedback. Um, because I, I think there are some folks that are living there that are a little older and they may have a problem with it as well. So I'd, I'd like to hear from them. Okay. Is okay. Tentatively, you know, I, I could go along with both of your comments right now. Um, I guess, I guess we could have a timeline of, does anybody have a, like, because we have to give uh, legal some information on this and our colleagues. Is it like 20 days, 30 days? Anybody have any ideas uh, what would be fair for this kind of thing? Hello, 
This is Rochelle Krieber. May I be recognized, please? Yes, you may. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so I was following along on the screen and its options. And number three was differentiating between hosted and unhosted rentals. And I think I had you know, stated before that I happen to share a driveway with um, an Airbnb. And from what I know, it's hosted. So first of all, if we're going to differentiate between the hosted and unhosted rentals, how do we monitor that they are truly hosted rentals? And then just to point out, most of the things that have been mentioned, especially uh, the increased Ubers coming into the neighborhood and people parking on the street, and then there, uh, therefore not being enough space for us to park on the street or have our guests park on the street, as well as I think I've mentioned that um, I've had people walk up to my door. I have a ring camera and they try the door because evidently the place next to me that's an Airbnb, she must have just said I've left the door unlocked. So there are so many factors here and I have to believe that they apply to both the hosted and unhosted rentals. Um, and again, as I stated before, had I known that there was an Airbnb next to me, I would not have purchased my home. Yeah, I just want to comment that right now, I think where we're at, to be fair, is there would be a two, two week limit to anybody renting their home. Regardless of hosted or unhosted? Right, and we haven't got into that discussion, but I think right now we're at a two week limit okay. across the board for residential zoned area. Uh, so, um, and with registration, I think what we're looking for is, I think the city really wants to know, as you might want to know, uh, you know, on, you know, this football game with Michigan or whatever, that home next to you is going to be rented. Um, and, uh, and then there may be a tax also paid for that. And, you know, that thing then is processed. Uh, the police can have that information. And then if you have a, a, a problem with that, uh, you could call in and, you know, we could go through the entire procedure. We haven't got to uh, crime and punishment yet, but uh, that'd be part of the regulations. Uh, and uh, Chris was sort of getting into that, you know, or, you know, two strikes you're out, or it could be one, one strike you're out, you're never going to rent your house again, or so as a way of protecting you. So, yes, I think right now the committee is suggesting that it's a two week period that, that is the max for renting your house in a residential area. I don't know if that gives you any assuage, any of your uh, concerns or not. It, it does. I wasn't sure. You know, like I said, I'm looking here at the um, the options, and number three was differentiate between hosted and unhosted rentals. So I didn't know which direction uh, council was leaning with that, but I just wanted to reinforce the points that I had made earlier that I, sure. I really don't think that it makes a difference um, if you're the next door neighbor. Right. Okay. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. No, no, thank you for your comments again. It's much appreciated. And it certainly helps us uh, and gives us direction. Um, so we're now we're back to the uh, Bridge Street area. And we were discussing possibly the number of days. And, and, and again, like any ordinance that we write or any laws that we uh, prepare here. if I wouldn't laws, limit the number of days in Bridge Street. I would just make them subject to the same punishments. Okay, so you're, Chris, you're suggesting there's no limit to the number of days in Bridge Street, but when we go move back up the number three discussion, they're, they're regulated and punished like anybody else in the town. Right. Okay. And, and uh, Andy, are you okay with that? Andy? <laughs> yep, I'm on board with that. Okay. So what we're suggesting and telling staff, legal staff, is that Bridge Street can allow all kinds of rentals for uh, rentals to go on throughout the year. And, uh, but they're going to be subject to the regulation and fines, et cetera, that uh, residential people are. Okay. So right? I, I would just ask one question. Um, yes. So Bridge Street is a big category. And I would ask Jenny Roush maybe to like, which specific districts in Bridge Street or do we want, because Bridge Street includes certain historic uh, districts all the way over to sawmill and then back all the way over to post right. road right. And, it, and it does include other single family areas like graystone Mews. and i'm we can look at it maybe it's the the larger neighborhoods like either sawmill center or um 
where Bridge Park is. So we could look at some targeting those more mixed use areas. Is that your intent by that, Mr. Rainer? Is that what you're I, th I think that's what we're we're intending, right? Right, team. Or you, you could look at the uh, Bridge Street or maybe uh, multifamily, uh, the multifamily component there, perhaps. Okay. Okay. Just to take it to council, they may have different. They may have some different opinions, but mm -hmm. just a recommendation to move forward. Okay, so uh, I, you know, I think I agree. I think it was Kreber that said that you know, hosted or unhosted, it may not matter. You know, there was some discussion that if there's somebody in the house, it's not going to get too crazy. But I don't know if if we really should be concerned with that. I think um, you know, uh, I, I don't know if we even want to get into that. I just. You know, the two week limit, I think, sounds very fair. Um, let's see. Um, let's see if there's any other notes I have here from the meetings and from legal. I think that sort of sums it up. I mean, we can uh, send these. Um, these recommendations to Council to have them typed up and uh, see what our colleagues have to say about them. Um, I don't know if there's any other input we really want to have. Um, I Chair, think. I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, just to be clear on the two week cap, is the committee's thought to have it be 14 days total like the previous proposal or minimum of one week increments as Mr. Fishman suggested suggested earlier. I think the I think the security from what would be and this was mentioned by uh, one of the call in people is to, is to list them in weeks. And I guess the question is do they have to be consecutive? Um, what if what if a I don't know what you call it, call a client of an Airbnb, but the um, occupant, the short term occupant, if they only want to be there for three days, does that mean that the property owner or host forfeits uh, the four days of that week or, you know, how would that work? No, that's a, and that's a good question because if you're renting your house for the Irish festival and it's three days, well, of course, they actually come in and by the time they leave and clean up and go, it's probably four or five days because you have three days of activity. Say you're a vendor selling some kind of Irish bric-a-brac and you're going to rent someone's home instead of a hotel. I mean... If, if I could interject, I think I have something that might help this. Um, okay. So when we had the original legislation, we proposed the 14-night limit. And that could be used, you could have one night here, one night there. And I know we've identified the tracking problem as an issue, but what we were going to do was create an electronic filing system with notification system with the planning department. So you would register your short-term rental and then prior to renting it out on any night, you had to file just online a submission with the planning department saying, I'm renting my home, it's for two nights, starting this date, ending this date, and there are going to be five people there. And so we will have record of every time somebody's staying there, or they're committed to do this in the registration. So we could keep track of those individual nights, and once they reach 14, the next time they file a notification, we would say, no, you you hit your days. I mean, it just seems more fair because more people are probably going to want to rent their house for maybe a weekend here, a weekend there versus, you know, you can only have two one week increments. Okay. Is everybody in agreement with Jennifer's suggestion? Are we all? So that's how I would have initially envisioned it. Okay. Um, you know, it could be 14 one night stays, but um, Mr. Fishman was one of the first folks on this call to say two weeks, not 14 days. And what I, I imagine, and I'd like to hear from Mr. Fishman, you're probably trying to avoid the number of different guests. You don't want a different group in there every night of the 14. You'd rather have one family this week and another family next week. So you're, you're limiting your risk, I guess, 
by making it two weeks. Is that what you had in mind, Mr. Fish? Am I on? Can you hear me? Yes. We can hear you. Yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Um, it, it's not necessarily, that's, that's part of it. Um, the, the keeping track of Jennifer has that under control, but I think what happens is it, it's pretty easy to cheat on, on the day. The, 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 the three uh, Airbnbs next to us, there's people moving in and out all the time. Okay. They're, they're there for a couple days, three days, and then, then there's another set of cars. There are not, uh, other people. Um, I, I also wanted to comment that, that you were talking about uh, uh, people renting their houses for a year, long-term people. Those people are normally vetted. Um, and, and, and by law, if you vet one, if you have a rental and you vet one person, you've got to vet everybody. Okay. So, so everybody's vetted, um, uh, when, when there's a long-term rental, but it's not just the, the pe people that they, uh, if you have two weeks and, he, and the guy gets shorted four days, that's his fault. He could schedule, uh, somebody for four days and, 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 and somebody else for three days, the same week. Okay. Which this guy does. Okay across the street from me. I mean, he's got it packed uh, until uh, Corona came along. He had it packed almost every week. So, um, uh, and the other thing I wanted to mention, I think you need to, we haven't talked much about the amount of people that are allowed in the house. You know, there's, there's city codes, you know, I, I know when I rent for a year, you have to have no more than five people in a four bedroom house or a three bedroom, whatever, uh, depending on square feet. And, and that does not occur when you're on an Airbnb. There, there's there been 20 or 30 people in the houses across the street from me, uh, as my neighbor will tell you, and they're there for a weekend and they're sleeping in sleeping bags and 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 uh, um, their family reunions. We even had a political thing there for 30 days where there were tons of people in and out. So um, I, I think it's a lot different. But anyway, to answer your question, I think it's just easier to monitor when you say two weeks and if the guy gets short of three days, so be it. Okay, um, uh, and 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 uh, uh, the, uh, most events, like John said, if they're going to be there five or six days anyway, because by the time they get in and out and and whatever, so that was. Andy, does that is that okay? I mean, you're in a, is that okay, or do you want to break it down numerically to days? How do you feel about that? May I be recognized? This is Rochelle Kreber again. Sure, Michelle. Oh, right, go ahead. I would like to second uh, what the gentleman just ahead of me said. Um, it seems like it's somewhat of an honor system if it's going to be 14 days and you could get 14 different groups of people staying there during those 14 days. Uh, and so um, I agree with everything that he said, basically two weeks would be a lot easier to monitor um, and to hold someone to the two weeks. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Andy, can, can you live with that, Andy? Andy, can you hear me? I, lose I don't have anything else. No, okay. Is that yeah. okay? The, the two week thing instead of the numerical thing, is that already? Right? Okay. Thank you, Chris. I'm far more interested in the enforcement piece than I am the number of nights. <laughs> um, okay. You know, 14 days of misery is 14 days of misery. Uh, you know, if, if somebody, so, uh, I think the discussion that you know council needs to have is well, how are we going to enforce this? We we can say however many days it is that we want to say, but it but at the end of the day we're trying to protect our neighborhoods and we're trying to protect right. property values and we're trying to protect our people. You know, if that could be one day or that could be an infinite amount of days if the teeth were right in the enforcement piece so that we we're able to pluck all of the bad apples out of the basket in a hurry and make sure that they were gone for a long time. Now, do you think, Chris, do you have um, confidence that legal staff can come up with that particular program or do you want to amplify your thoughts or where are you at? Oh, I think Thad and Jennifer are far more than capable of, I, I think they know what we're trying to do, right? What we want to do is we don't want to be burdensome to our residents. We want to protect property values. We want to give people a little bit of leeway to make some extra dollars as the federal government provides. And, you know, at the end of the day, we want 
to, you know, you hate to have to legislate people being good neighbors, but that's where we are. Okay. And let me, one other thing before we close down the meeting, because I think we covered uh, most of the discussion. How about taxing? Is this going to be a taxable? Visit? Absolutely. They need to pay bed tax money just like everybody else that stays overnight in, this, in, a, in a purchased place. Okay. And actually under current code, existing code, these are taxable nights. And so the registration is going to facilitate us collecting it. Really the only reason we're not collecting now on some of the Airbnbs is because we don't know about them. So we can and will collect bed tax on those. And I, you know, and to back Chris's thoughts on this, like if somebody just sort of pulls up into another house and starts piling into it, I mean, with the correct regulations, I mean, we can have the police out there in 20 minutes and, and really enforce, you know, this and then try to collect the taxes and then find out what's going on. Um, okay, well, is there any oh, other- if I, I'm sorry, if I can just recap, because I just want to make sure we get this exactly right. Um, if we're going to move. So just looking at the options that are on the screen. So the way I understand the, the discussion, we're going to do number two, which is we're going to require registration of all short-term rentals. And mm -hmm. actually um, the Columbus ordinance had been mentioned and our ordinance is based on the Columbus ordinance. So um, the draft that we had before council before is based in large part on Columbus's registration requirement. Um, we are not going to differentiate between hosted and unhosted rentals. Mm -hmm. We are going to put a cap on of uh, two weeks right. on um, the, the duration. We will look at the Bridge Street districts and maybe bring suggestions to you for some of the multi-family areas where there could be unlimited um, nights. Um, we're not going to prohibit short-term rentals in certain zoning districts. We're not going to prohibit all short-term rentals and we're not maintaining the status quo. That's that's and, all. That's correct from what I understand. Is that okay with the committee? Put your thumbs up or we all in? Yep. Okay. And the other thing I would note is that the existing draft ordinance, the penalty is it's the first violation is an unclassified misdemeanor um, and a fine of not more than 250. Each subsequent, the very next offense is a misdemeanor of the third degree and a fine of not more than $500 or prison. So we do have a nice penalty in there, but maybe we go through the registration and we can yank registrations quicker or like- I think the revocation of registration yes. is important. And that, that criminal penalty that Jennifer mentioned is taken from the Columbus ordinance as well. You know, I just was at a house, strangely enough, um, on a visit, and they said, my neighbor's killing him. He's making eight to $10,000 here in, on, in a short cycle because he's packing them in through air. As a matter of fact, there was an Airbnb people pulling out when I was standing there. So I don't know how, I don't know if you can have tougher enforcement. Back, back with Andy and Chris have said that to make this thing, because when you're looking at the monetary value of, of, of these Airbnbs uh, and what you're charging. Um, some people $800 a night, because uh, a lot of people coming. Uh, you guys, if you would, legal, I'd like you to see if you could tighten up some of that and uh, uh, see what we could do about it. Because there's just too much financial incentive to do right. this. And if a fine's 250 bucks and if you get caught or not, eh. So I don't know, you know, what you could come up with that could put a little more teeth in this. But I think from listening to my two colleagues, they're they're interested in that aspect of it. I see bobbing heads. So Don, I think we've given them enough. Maybe okay. Enough. Well, guys, let's it's it's uh, past the seventh evening hour. So is there any other comments? Oh, okay. uh, can I just get a motion uh, just out? approving everything we just said for recommendation to city council. So let's have a, uh, a roll call for the uh, items that we had uh, covered. Um, I'll, move, I'll move to uh, direct staff to bring to council a policy relative to our conversation this evening. Okay, and I'll second that. And uh, let's do a roll call, Andy. Yes. Chris. Yes. And myself, yes. Um, is there anything else 
we want to discuss before the, uh, nope, terminating this meeting. Okay, well, uh, vote for adjournment. Anybody? Thanks for hosting, John, appreciate it. Yep, I motion that we adjourn. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay, thank you all. Thanks. Give me your third. All right. <laughs> Good night. Everybody have a most blessed and happy Good evening. Night. Thank you.